my brother and to find out information about my brother. This is my first time here. And I've been searching and trying to find answers to my uncle's disappearance, like he went missing in action. This has been an ongoing thing for like five or six years. But my uncle has been missing for seven, almost 70 years he's been missing. And we had no information we had no correspondence from the military all those years. So I started investigating about six or seven years ago about my Uncle Charlie. And I found out how I can get in touch with certain people and how I can get information. And then I got a letter telling me about this meeting. My mom, me and my mom, we started trying to get ready and everything for the meeting. This right here. But my mom died. She died last August. Um, you know, she had uh, 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 cancer. And she wanted to be here with me. And I just, I'm so excited about being here and I'm just so amazed about the wonderful things that's happening. And I got something to take back to my family because we always want an answer. And I, I, I we have one now. And thank you guys. Barge and my father was Corporal Dun, uh, Donald Dundor. Um, I asked my mother a couple years back if he was drafted or if he enlisted. He enlisted because he wanted to go ahead and do his time and come home and take care of her fa family and own a gas station like his father. Um, he got married shortly before going over. Apparently during their honeymoon they had a good time because a couple months later he found out that he was going to be a father. But it was um, the last push for Pork Chop Hill at the end of the war, he went missing in action. So he never got to know whether he had a son or a daughter, and I never got to know my father. And this past year, my mother passed away. So this is kind of bittersweet because I would always go home after one of these and tell her everything. This year I can't do that. But I also realized Memorial Day, I have nobody else left in my life who can share the memories of my father to me. And it's, so I'm glad that some of you people got the chance to meet your loved ones, and the ones who haven't, I'm sure hope you get the stories from your families. Um, and I'm so glad that this organization exists. I wish I had known about it years and years ago when my grandmother was still alive. I found out because my husband being in the service, we used to get these afterburners, and they had a little blurb in it, and that's how I got a hold of this organization. So if you know anybody, tell me to get a hold of this organization, no matter what war it is. My name is uh, Robert Johnston Moore. My father was Sergeant James Fred Johnston. My father joined the Army. Uh, Going to make a career when he was 16. The local pharmacist said he was 18. My grandmother was not happy about that at all, but there wasn't anything she could do about it. So anyway, he uh, uh, in 1940 when he went into the army, he fought all the way through World War II. Fought on uh, Guadalcanal, uh, Saipan, Guam, Kenya, and uh, actually survived all of that, believe it or not. And, and then uh, went home for a while. Married my mother, they had known each other since they were in elementary school. Married my mother, then they uh, went to Fort Benning, Georgia for training, for infantry training. Spent some time there, and uh, I think that's where I got started in the picture, from what I understand from my mother. And uh, after that, my father was shipped over to Japan. The war had started uh, shortly after that, and he went to uh, uh, Korea and landed in Incheon. My wife and I are going to Korea in September, and we're going to land in Incheon. And to be able to go there where my father first put his, put his feet on the uh, Korean soil is going to be a special time. 72 years later, if you can imagine that. Anyway, my father fought with the uh, uh, South Korean soldiers. They went to uh, Seoul, took that back with the Marine Corps, they took it back. Then they went all the way up to the Chosin Reservoir. And uh, he named me from a foxhole there, named me after my grandfather and after him. And uh, I'm very proud 
son of his, and uh, the only child of his, and uh, he remains there today, I hope not, but I hope he's in one of those 55 boxes or at the punch bowl. So we're hopeful for that and looking forward to that. I know the rest of you are as well. But uh, tomorrow, I'm going to be able to go to the Library of Congress and share my father's story to have it permanently put into the archives of, of the uh, uh, Library of Congress. And you can do that too, by the way. That's a great way to keep the story alive. So anyway, thank you. Hello, I'm retirement Sergeant Dominga Briones. I was with the military for a little bit, about 33 years. I am proud of my uncle. My, excuse me, yeah, my uncle. He was a Daraido Mata Solis. He, he served in uh, Korea, became a MIA December the 1st, 1950. I went to Korea in 1995, but on a mission. And not the same kind of mission he had been there with. But still, at that point, I hadn't found out all the story that I have now. And I am proud to say that as a veteran, we always welcome people into our units, into our companies. And every time I come here, I ask people, are you here by yourself? And it's surprising how many people will say, yes, I'm here by myself. I don't have anybody here. But we have each other. We don't need to be alone. Introduce yourself, ask who you are, who's your family member, and together we can get through all of this. Thank you. Hi, my name is Polly Royer, and I'm here because of my father-in-law, Captain Ted Royer. Uh, he was shot down on the northern border, so they have never recovered the plane or the crew members or anything. And potentially, it's not looking good for any kind of an update. So we haven't been going to updates. Uh, but my husband was seven years old when this happened. His mother had a nervous breakdown. He never went through the death process and the emotional different uh, things. And I can tell you this story because he's asleep up in the hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I knew nothing about any of this because he was raised by his mother and his grandmother, and they never disclosed any information. He never discussed any of this with me. He still doesn't discuss this with me, but I did find out when we were married for 30 years that when he was in high school, he played mind games with himself. He would put the baseball bat up on his shoulder and stand at home plate and tell himself, if I hit a home run, my dad's coming home. So he has been messed up all these years. Thank goodness for the Air Force Department asked us several years ago when I said, can't we put a sign up on the highway on I-10 out of San Antonio, Texas that said in honor of Captain Ted Royer? And they said, well, have you ever had any kind of service? I said, no, no kind of funeral, no kind of memorial. She had a nervous breakdown, nothing ever happened. They set up an Arlington memorial service for us with a horse-drawn carriage and the Air Force band, and we had the, we have the, we still have the tombstone up there on the side of the hill. So I want to read to you and to tell you that it's very important for you to Share the information that you have with your family, with your children, with your grandchildren, because we might not be alive whenever they finally get these remains. I know they will someday, but uh, at this memorial service, my grandson, who is 10 years old now, this happened in 2019, and my son is named after his grandfather. He's a Ted Royer also. But my grandson read this 
at the service. I'm here because of you and things I never saw you do. My world is bright. I sleep safe at night. I'm here because of you. There are others next to me. I hope that you can see. They hold my hand and tell me I can be who I'm supposed to be. I'll learn to stand up tall, help others when they fall, and try to do all I can do. I'm here because of you. Mm. My name is uh, Nick Berenger. Uh, my rank is uh, E9. I'm a mess chief in the United States Navy, and uh, I'm here with uh, DPAA for my grandfather. Uh, I found out about the DPAA through my uh, Aunt Sherilyn. Um, she is, uh, uh, so my family member is uh, Albert Rowe Tiffany, and he's my grandfather, and I came with my aunt, so his daughter and uh, my father is his son. Um, yeah, that's how I found out about uh, DPAA. April 22nd, 1951, he was uh, shot down uh, 20 miles southwest of Wonsan. Uh, he was a flight lead. Uh, he was from Composite Squadron 3 on board uh, USS Princeton. And uh, his uh, mission that morning, he flew at 0400. He took off uh, the Princeton and uh, he was with a, a flight of four. He was the lead aircraft and uh, they were, their mission were to bomb uh, some trucks and uh, some personnel in an area, uh, like I stated before, about 20 miles southwest of Wonsan. Mm -hmm. uh, as they commenced the run, they, they reached their target area and uh, saw their targets, and uh, they commenced their attack run. And uh, his wingman had, uh, as they were inbound, uh, saw a fireball. And uh, his plane was hit with uh, anti-air artillery, and uh, he had uh, crashed into a hill. Wow. Um, the uh, the three other aircraft circled around after the crash to do some reconnaissance and uh, they said the trajectory of the aircraft with the crash it was kind of like on a slant and uh, uh, they saw a parachute canopy and uh, some slide marks like um, he had been pulled from the, it looked like he had been pulled from the area so they listed him MIA uh, he was MIA for three years and in 1954 was less, uh, listed uh, KIA uh, it was it was interesting. It was the first time I've been here, and uh, so first uh, it was they had shown an area uh, last year. Uh, we thought it was North Wonsan, and then after they did a datum search and looked at maps and everything, we were told uh, they had a more of a confined area of the southwest region, like we had talked about. Mm -hmm. um, my aunt's going to get some letters together and make sure the CEO wrote a letter to my grandmother, uh, Rosalind. And uh, we might try to get some more details about exactly where that crash site might be. My hopes is that leaving that sample, um, there's an opportunity uh, of possibly identifying him. But I know with the area that he was shot down and uh, the po political tension there is right now, or the political climate mm -hmm. between uh, North Korea and uh, the United States, um, I'm hopeful that uh, we're able to go in that area and, and maybe find the crash or find maybe a piece of the aircraft, and then uh, that would lead to finding uh, my grandfather as well. Uh, yes, his name was on the wall, and uh, just the whole atmosphere and um, being a part of this group and seeing what the EPA does is uh, very fortunate, and uh, I'm really, uh, it's a very humbling experience, especially hearing all the families and their stories, and uh, just really puts things into perspective, and. It's just uh, good for people to get together in that community of uh, POWs, MIAs, and everything. It's, it's good for the families to have this for uh, like an outlet in a, in a community for support. You'll excuse me. Uh, first of all, I'd like to mention my own feeling that I think God is a good God. He takes care of all of us. And personally, uh, I sit here with mixed emotions high and low in some of the stories I hear because I was the 17-year-old 
I was the one that went into Korea. I was in, uh, in July, the latter part of July, I was in Okinawa in 1950. The war started in, Ju in July. Then when we, my brother and them first went in on July the 6th. They were the first groups in the 34th Division, and I was in Okinawa. I was not aware of the fact that he had been in, that they shipped him into uh, Korea. However, because of the need of our groups going in, for those of you who are not familiar with the history of why uh, uh, Korea stands out among a lot of the wars, when our people went in, whether you know it or not, they went in with a 45 pistol, a clip, a weapon, and another clip, and that was their protection. Those first 500 and some that was brought out of uh, Tokyo to stop the passage of the groups going south, the Koreans. He was the buffer zone. I was not aware exactly what his position was, but I do know in Okinawa, I was attached to what they call the 29th group, the airborne group, our airplanes. I was a loadmaster, so to speak. They needed help in Korea in getting supplies into them. A lot of people ask me, uh, what is the most memorial thing I can think about in uh, Korea? And uh, it's a sorrowful thing, but every morning I wake up, every night I go to bed. I think of the same thing. Uh, they dropped me into Kempo the first day we took it. It was the airport, the main airport, south of Seoul. And we needed that for the fighter planes coming in for regrouping and things like that. Well, that first day we went in, we were unloading, taking supplies up to the front. About four o'clock in the afternoon, we were notified all planes had to leave. There was gonna be a, an attack on the Kempo field, which she was relating to at that particular time where we dropped her brother out of. So that all the planes had to be taken out. There was about 18 or 20 of us air, airmen there that were not attached to any of the group, so we became infantry. For, a, for that evening, and we were assigned to a, a, a foxhole. Now, this, the only reason I'm telling you, because you have to understand and feel like a, a vet that I appreciate what you're doing, and it makes life worthwhile to me. I was placed in the foxhole that night, about nine o'clock, we were told there was a group coming up to take the field to prepare for hand-to-hand -hand combat. About 10 minutes, we heard the group coming up the highway, I had my rifle ready to fire. A runner came down yelling, abort, abort, abort. That means to those who don't understand, forget it, drop to the ground, keep quiet, you don't mess with them, nothing. We let the group go through. Well, I didn't know at that time really what I had just witnessed and why. About a month later, I was guarding some prisoners in Kempo and the uh, base, uh, base commander came by in a jeep they loaded me on a plane, flew me out of Korea into Japan and over the Japan waters telling me that my brother had been captured and, you know, that two siblings could not be in the same front at the same time. So at that time, they gave me a choice, and it seems the news media has picked up on this, but they asked me that I, if I wanted to go home, they said, you can go home or you can go back to what you were doing. And they asked me what I wanted to do, and I told them, well, I'm going back. And the captain, he said, why? I said, hell, it's the right thing to do. And uh, anyway, at that time, when they told me about all this, they also told me about my brother, and then it came together. That group, you've heard of the death walk in Korea? When they first went in and hit that town, there's 500 and some people with our military, they captured and killed half of them. Well, that, the North Koreans were dressed as civilians and guarding the prisoners, taking them on that death walk. That group that I came two minutes from firing on my own brother was that group was coming through. So to me, every time I hear some of you talk, I'm so thankful and I want you to know, on behalf of all the veterans, we appreciate what you're doing. You're wonderful, and thank you.